Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the long-term care crisis. Makes me wonder why it's been allowed to go on so long. A CBC Marketplace investigation uncovers a disturbing connection in homes with deadly outbreaks. And... I did not expect this at all. The devastating side effects for residents and families. I'm Andrew Chang. Also tonight, George Floyd laid to rest. There are people rising up that will never sit down until you get justice. The emotional calls for justice and for lasting change from Houston and beyond. We're not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. But those who cheated to get emergency help could be looking at hefty fines, even jail time. And back on the field in Quebec. I just want to play soccer. It doesn't matter if we have to wash our hands every five seconds. What team sports could look like in COVID times. This is The National. For all the ways COVID-19 has affected Canadians, we know it has devastated one group in particular, residents of long-term care homes. Right now, in Ontario alone, 73 homes have outbreaks. More than 1,700 residents have died. And tonight, we're learning what links some of the homes that have been hardest hit. First up, how they're set up, often with an older layout, putting four residents in a single room. That's a problem for infection control. Another link, who's running them? Many times, it's for-profit companies. David Common explains why, despite some new safety standards being put in place two decades ago, some facilities still haven't done the renovations. When COVID struck the nursing home where Dillis Patterson's mom lived, she pulled her out fast, fearing how quickly the virus would spread in a tight room Joan shared with three others. It just seemed like it'd be impossible to control that infection. It was. 67 residents have now died at the home, and data analyzed by CBC Marketplace reveals how the buildings themselves may be connected to how deadly an outbreak becomes. 22 years ago, Ontario mandated new nursing home rooms house no more than two people, in large part to control infection. Everything from visitors to privacy curtains can spread viruses. But rooms that already had more than two beds have been long grandfathered in place. So now, about a third of Ontario's beds only meet a nearly 50-year-old standard. It is in those facilities where 57% of the deaths have occurred. Older buildings have a higher death toll, the vast majority of which are owned by for-profit companies. An association representing them says there is insufficient funding from government for renovations. But elder advocate Jane Metis points out not-for-profit homes have upgraded faster than homes run by for-profit groups. And frankly, there's no impetus for the homes to, to rebuild. Um, they are full. They don't have to uh, change in order to keep full. Makes me wonder why it's been allowed to go on so long. Dillis is now looking for a new home for her mom and has no interest in a four-person room this time. So David, if families want rooms with fewer people, why haven't there been more renovations? Well, the homes don't have to pay with re for, for renovations in order to fill those beds. There's 37,000 people, Adrian, who are on a waiting list in this province alone to get into a nursing home. Families often desperate to get at one of those beds, even if it means going into a four-person room. And remember, the rules say you haven't been able to build a new home like that for a couple of decades with multiple people, four people to a room. But if those already exist, well, that's okay. Take Camilla Care, this nursing home right here, plenty of multiple resident rooms. And tragically, Adrian, one in three of the residents here has died. All right, David Common, thank you so much. Now, along with so many deaths, COVID has also brought chaos to many long-term care homes. Staff falling ill, loved ones locked out, and now some left with questions about care. Chris Glover has the story of one resident who died, not from the virus, but from a lack of nourishment. This is how Pietro Brucoleri's family says they last saw him at his nursing home. We left him three months ago, plump and rosy in the cheeks. 
As COVID ravished Woodbridge Vista Care community, the nursing home was put in lockdown. Oh. Brucolari's family could no longer help support him, but consistently were told the 82 year old with advanced dementia tested negative for the virus and was doing fine. Suddenly, May 29th, they got a call he was dying. We knew that one day this would happen, but not in this care. I did not expect this at all. A coroner's report lists his cause of death as inanition, which means exhaustion caused by lack of nourishment. This was mommy's birthday. When they got to say goodbye, his daughters say his gaunt, cold body lay in a stiflingly hot room. Birthday. Very heartbreaking, devastated, disgusted. We did not ex expect the neglect. A Toronto geriatrician says malnutrition is a common ending for dementia patients, but suspects the coroner used the rare phrase inanition for emphasis. When they looked at the body, that they were struck by how malnourished it looked. That would be my guess. 23 residents at the home have died from COVID-19. The province has seized control and the army's been called in to help. The home's operator won't comment on Brucolari's case, but in a statement said we are closely monitoring all residents and continue to provide supports. I feel like we failed. <laughs> Compounding their grief, the Brucolaris almost removed their dad in April, but Hello? the home assured them he was safe. Our father is gone, but I will keep fighting for him and all those beautiful people in that home. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Deaths in long-term care are a major factor in a terrible milestone reached today in Quebec. It has recorded more than 5,000 deaths from COVID-19. 90% were in the province's care homes. Premier Francois Legault apologized and pledged to do better. Quebec makes up a large proportion of Canada's 7,900 coronavirus deaths. More than 96,000 people have tested positive across the country. In addition to the health crisis, millions have been out of work and have applied for government help. Well, today the Trudeau government announced what it intends to do about those who got funds who weren't entitled to them. David Cochran explains. Not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. Obviously, this is a time for us to pull together as a country. He's not turning off the taps, but the Prime Minister wants to tighten the screws on fraud. But unfortunately, in every situation, there are a few criminals uh, who will deliberately try to take advantage of a moment of... Uh, Solidarity. So new legislation with new penalties. If you accidentally got money you weren't entitled to, you will have to pay it back. But if you knew from the start you weren't entitled to the CERB, there's a fine of up to 300%. And if you try to get improper benefits going forward, you face a fine and up to six months in jail. They're effectively opening up the floodgates to retroactively charging people just for applying. The NDP isn't buying Trudeau's assurances that honest mistakes won't be punished and condemning other changes to make the CERB less generous, like reducing benefits to two weeks at a time from four and cutting off people who turn down the chance to return to work when it's reasonably safe. The idea is to urge people to move from the CERB to the wage subsidy and back to work. If we're going to have the economy recover, we're going to need to get workers back to the jobs they were in pre-COVID. Uh, and so it's, I think, really important that government make, make uh, changes to CERB to ensure that it does just that. That's the line the Liberals are trying to walk to keep the benefits for the people who truly need them but not make them a barrier to economic reopening. Of course, this is a minority parliament, so it's all subject to negotiation. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning now to the story that has triggered waves of grief and outrage across the U.S. and around the world. George Floyd's death at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer inspired weeks of protest against anti-black racism. Today, his body was laid to rest in Houston. To millions, he is now a symbol. To family and friends, he was Big Floyd. And to a daughter, he is the dad who changed the world. Stephen D'Souza now with George Floyd's funeral and legacy. We may, we may weep, we may mourn, 
will be comforted and we will find hope. George Floyd was remembered today as someone larger than life. There was pain. I just want to say I, to him I love you and um, I thank God for giving me, giving me my own personal Superman. I bless you all. And there was anger. No more hate crimes, please. Someone said make America great again, but when has America ever been great? Today's private service was as much about remembering his life as it was a call to action. Many here believe God gave Floyd a purpose. And that purpose was around the world that there are people rising up that will never sit down until you get justice. Images of protests showed his impact. He changed not only this country, not only the United States, he changed the world. Presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden appeared in a taped message. When there is justice for George Floyd, we will truly be on our way to racial justice in America. And then, as you said, Gianna, your daddy will have changed the world. With him, a legal team. Reverend Al Sharpton delivered the eulogy, promising to stay with the family on the long road to justice. Until we know the price for black life is the same as the price for white life, we're going to keep coming back to these situations over and over again. After the service, Floyd's casket made a final procession as hundreds lined the route. Among those who waited hours in the heat, the hopeful, the mourning, and the inspired. I wanted to be the part of something that's the beginning of something that can be really big. Like, this whole situation is changing the world, and I'm just glad that we can be out here and be a part of it. Floyd was buried beside his late mother, a final goodbye for a man whose death sparked a movement that people here hope will live on. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Houston. Ontario Premier Doug Ford weighed in on growing calls to defund police in the wake of George Floyd's death. Here's what he said when asked about cutting the Ontario provincial police budget today. Well, I don't believe in that for a second. I think we need a, a strong uh, uh, police uh, within our communities. What we do need to do is have higher standards. We need to uh, focus on more training and community policing, get involved in, in the community. With some 6,200 uniformed officers, the OPP is the second largest police force in Canada after the RCMP. It polices more than 300 municipalities with an annual budget of over a billion dollars. The concept of defunding the police includes moving money into social services. As Katie Nicholson tells us, this is a conversation renewed again after another call to police ended with a death. Yellow tape encircles the scene of another fatal police encounter, this one just north of Toronto. Police were called to this home after reports that a man inside was trying to set the place on fire. Neighbours say he had a history of strange behaviour. Just two weeks ago, a 29-year-old woman in mental distress plunged to her death after police were called to her apartment. It's not clear what happened, but Regis Korczynski Paquette's death renewed calls from the black community to defund the police, diverting police funding to other community support services, something echoed by this mental health advocate. Far too often, I feel like police escalate situations to the point that someone in crisis ends up dying. A CBC News analysis of 17 years of fatal interactions with police in Canada found that 42% of those who died were mentally distressed at the time. People like Michael Elegon, a Toronto man gunned down as he ran towards police with a knife. And Paul Boyd, shot multiple times as he crawled toward Vancouver police. 16, Arthur Gallant has been apprehended by police multiple times when he has been in mental crisis. I feel like a criminal. I, I believe police interacting with someone who's in crisis is essentially criminalizing mental health. The head of Hamilton's Innovative Crisis Response Programs says police are a key part of what they do. It routinely pairs specially trained police with mental health workers. It would be unsafe, frankly, to send mental health workers on their own to a 911 call. The Canadian Mental Health Association agrees. I don't think it's an us and them, and I really would like to think of it in the context of the individual who's in crisis and what do they need. 
The answer, she says, more, not less money for police training and more for mental health services, so fewer people end up even needing police intervention in the first place. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. CBC News journalist Wendy Mesley, formerly a host on this program, is off the air tonight pending an internal investigation. As Eli Glasner explains, it stems from a word she said in an editorial meeting, one she says she should never have used. It's a show that bears her name, but this past Sunday, the weekly with Wendy Mesley was without its host. Mesley was off the air after what the CBC calls an incident. On Twitter today, Mesley said, in the context of an editorial discussion about current issues regarding race, I used a word that should never be used. She wrote, I was quoting a journalist we were intending to interview. I hurt people and I'm deeply sorry. I'm also deeply ashamed. Both the CBC and Mesley declined on camera interviews. CBC said in a statement she is off air pending an investigation. Mesley says she's been asked to keep the process confidential. I'm not sure why it is that after all these years, you know, white uh, journalists can't figure out. There are just some words that you don't say in front of people. I mean, Andre Demis is a contributing editor at McLean's magazine. He says this is part of a larger issue of systemic racism in journalism, pointing to a series of missteps this week at CBC, including the airing of a video that focused on the police's perspective and due to a technical error, omitted the final moments when the vehicle drove into protesters. The footage we broadcast did not meet CBC's journalistic standards. Admit you've got a problem. There, in our national broadcaster, there's a commitment to diversity, but there is no conversation around who makes the news, who's in front of the camera, who's behind the cameras. Yesterday, CBC News's editor-in-chief outlined the steps it's taking, including half of new hires from underrepresented equity groups, training editorial teams to be more inclusive in guest selection, and unconscious bias training. We've been having the same conversation since... But Demise is tired of waiting. I can't even tell you the amount of panels that I've been invited to or the amount of discussions that I've been asked to take part in where we do explore things like unconscious bias training, which is to me just an utter crock, where we do talk about uh, having new hires come in from underrepresented communities. The problem is when you bring those hires in, there is a bulwark. They don't get far in the workplace. Thanks so much for joining us. It's not clear how long the investigation will take or when Mesley could be back on air. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Some other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. Nova Scotia RCMP say a woman was attacked and killed by her own dog on a walk this morning. A passing jogger discovered her body along with the dog. He seemed kind of nice. Like, he didn't want to hurt me, but he knew that there was something wrong. The dog, described as a large pit bull, ran off, but was later struck and killed by a passing car. And the wayward humpback whale that's fascinated Montrealers for over a week appears to have died. A whale carcass was found floating in the St. Lawrence River east of the city this morning. Officials believed it's the same humpback. Fisheries and Oceans Canada say they are now trying to move the whale to a shore as delicately as possible to perform a necropsy. We went to bed, it's raining, we got up in the morning, everything's underwater out there. And half a dozen homes in southeastern Manitoba have been evacuated after three days of heavy rain led to some flooding. At least one municipality has declared a state of local emergency. Meanwhile, some 70 people are now returning to their homes in northern Alberta after floodwaters forced them out on Sunday night. Well, kids can now head back to the sports field in Quebec with a few new rules. I just want to play soccer. It doesn't matter if we have to wash our hands every five seconds. Next on The National, the new game plan for outdoor team sports. And couples forced apart by COVID-19 find a quiet spot along the border to reunite. A lot of the couples here call it Disneyland in North America because it's the happiest place on earth. And Canadians stuck at home looking for some puppy love. But what happens after the pandemic? It is a lifetime for the dog, right? Oh, I've got six new friends. We're back in two minutes. Watch this. A celebration erupting at a bar in Wellington. Patrons hit the floor at the stroke of midnight as New Zealand lifted physical distancing restrictions. The government says it has no active coronavirus cases. Here in Canada, some welcome news for Albertans today. The Premier says the entire province is ready to enter phase two of its relaunch strategy.
The deep economic and fiscal wounds will take some time to heal. But though we were bent, we have not been broken. Jason Kenney says the province has come through the pandemic better than most, and this Friday it will allow more businesses and services to reopen with restrictions. Among them, libraries, libraries, places of worship, movie theaters, and team sports for up to 50 players. Uh, some places can open earlier than expected as well, like arcades, gyms, and swimming pools. Now, Ontario announced today daycares will be allowed to reopen Friday. I want parents to know we will take every measure necessary to keep the kids and the staff safe and healthy. But among new restrictions, children and staff will be limited to groups of 10 or fewer. Everyone must be screened daily for COVID symptoms. Centers will be thoroughly cleaned throughout the day and toys that could spread germs will be removed. There's some good news for parents in Quebec too. Outdoor sports teams can begin practicing again, but as Allison Northcott explains, they have to follow some new rules on the pitch. This is a practice to see how soccer can work in the time of COVID-19. First practice in Quebec. Finally, we, we, found, we find our fields back. But it won't be like seasons past. Athletes here will be screened for symptoms before they can play. There will be hand sanitizing and instead of games, they'll do drills. I just want to play soccer. It doesn't matter if we have to wash our hands every five seconds, if we have to stay two meters apart. Along with the players and coaches, each practice will also have a dedicated person to ensure public health measures are followed on the field. The kids, they already uh, are uh, used to, uh, to be two meters away, to wash their hands. Over here, oh, the only thing we have to be careful is when the ball goes around, they tend to forget about it. It's not going to be sort of getting back on the field, it's going to be all the restrictions that we have. For baseball, he says it will take time and plenty of volunteers to be able to do it safely. Sanitize, you know, take temperatures, you know, uh, supply masks, supply gloves, whatever we have to do to make a safe and uh, sound atmosphere for the players. He says there will be some obvious differences like no umpires behind the plate. 11 year old Sanjay Shim is excited. He says staying home or playing with two people just isn't as fun as playing with a team. With Quebec cases trending down, this specialist says the risks are low if athletes stay outside and don't travel for games. The mixing of the teams could be a problem, but otherwise if you, you know, have um, sports within the same area, as long as you wash your hands, you don't like drool on top of one another, I think playing outside is actually quite safe. The hope here is that this first phase goes smoothly so more athletes can get on the field. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Blainville, Quebec. Now as more cities and provinces open up and people head back to work, public transit will get busier. There are new measures in place to keep people safe and steps you can take to protect yourself too. Take a look. So, you're back on the move. What should you expect taking public transit? Well, whether you take the train, the bus, or the subway, it's much quieter than usual. Fewer people, but also just literally quieter. There are no musicians playing, also nobody handing out newspapers or leaflets. There's a lot of people on transit and touching different surfaces. So if you were to touch a surface soon after somebody else did and then touch your face, yes, there is certainly a theoretical risk that you could pick up an infection that way. So keep your hands in your pockets and know that depending on the city you live in and the type of public transit you're taking, they may not actually be accepting cash, tickets or tokens. So it's tap only. But people should be your main concern. So on buses, most cities allow rear boarding only. That's to protect the driver in front. Next you may also find staggered seats marked off limits. That's to protect you. And by the way, a little tip if you find yourself on the subway where you'll find the fewest people at either end of the train. Don't just grab the car closest to your exit. That's what everyone does, spread out. Now, if you can't stay two meters away from other people, the advice these days is to wear a mask. And for heaven's sake, please, please, if you're sick, don't take public transit, stay at home. But take it from me, I take the subway to work every day. Being safe in such a confined space means staying away from other people and touching as few things as possible. They are disinfecting their vehicles much more often here in Toronto several times a day, but you can't count on that. So remember, the virus needs your help to get from your hands to your face. So don't touch, 
keep your hands clean and keep to yourself. Restrictions on the Canada-U.S. border from COVID-19 will likely remain in place for even longer. Sources telling CBC News tonight that an agreement has been reached reach to extend the measures. In the meantime, some families separated by the closure were able to reunite for the first time today thanks to a new exemption. But as Briar Stewart explains, those left out are forced to find some other ways to connect. The Peace Arch Park straddles the Canadian-American border in BC. It's a no man's land of sorts, and these days a haven for cross-border reunions. <laughs> and a fair number of weddings. Leah Bacello, a Canadian, married her American boyfriend here. We've been together for five years. It was something in our plan already. It was a bit of sense of urgency because we don't know how long this is going to go on for. Starting today, immediate family members and common-law spouses are able to come to Canada, but they have to quarantine for 14 days. That length of time is problematic for some. Bacello's husband is an essential worker in the U.S. You don't know what exactly it means. Um, but I'm quite excited for the prospect of him coming back uh, to Canada. The new rules don't apply to couples who have never lived together, so many will keep flocking to this park to find a quiet space on the grass or, for some more privacy, some even set up a tent. A lot of the couples here call it Disneyland in yeah. North America because it's the happiest place on earth for us that we get to meet up and hang out. But others have taken a different route to reunite. Even though restrictions have been in place at the borders for months now, several Canadians who've been turned away at land crossings have been able to fly into the United States to visit loved ones. That's what Madison Edge did. She knew she wasn't allowed to make the one hour drive to visit her fiance in Washington state, but she discovered she was able to fly to Seattle as US authorities aren't being as strict at airports. I was quizzed quite heavily about my employment, my return ticket to Canada, um, what my fiance does, but they eventually let me through. She and her partner are considered common law, so they will both make the journey north soon. As for the rest of the border restrictions, they're slated to be in place until at least June 21st. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Surrey. Next, a ground-level view of the U.S. protests from a Canadian photojournalist covering them. I saw them shaking their pepper spray bottles and, like, actively attacking us. I didn't really see that coming. I need help. I'm a journalist. Journalists targeted by police, perspective from a professional witness, and the image that stuck with them. Welcome back. Were it not for a witness, the brutality of the killing of George Floyd may not have been so known to the world. That video horrified the planet and the people around the world reacted. These are protests spurred by the killing of George Floyd. The researcher behind this map meticulously matching and verifying more than 2,000 dots and counting with news stories and social media posts. This is the view from 10,000 feet. All of it made real by these striking images from the ground. At times, this is a blood-stained window into the protests with journalists attacked for bearing witness, just doing their jobs. Sir, you're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind whoa, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, me whoa. why I'm under arrest, sir? I'm a reporter with KPIX5. I have my media credentials. From arrest to violence. Oh, whoa. It's added up. The American-based Freedom of the Press Foundation found in just under two weeks there were more than 380 violations against journalists in the United States. That's more than double the accounts in all of last year. So that is the kind of violence Canadian journalist Ed U knows. He's captured uprisings around the world, but covering these protests in a country he perhaps thought better of in terms of press freedom, well, that's come at a heavy cost. Please disperse or you will be arrested. I'm Ed O. Oh. I've been a journalist for almost 15 years now, and I've covered protest movements uh, all across the world. Being in the memorial for, uh, in the place where George Floyd was killed, feels a lot like, you know, Tahrir Square during Egypt, during uh, the Arab Spring, or Gezi Park in Turkey. The physical space of this memorial and what it represents 
it also, people gathering has really given everyone a specific sense of purpose or a specific sense of solidarity in which a lot of protesters are asking for change. People have expressed to me that this is one of the first few times that the media and people are now listening on a wider scale and really paying attention to grievances that have really always existed. This feels to me like kind of an organic leaderless movement in which uh, the issues are what's at stake. These protests that are happening across this country are speaking to a wider issue that's beyond any one root political cause. I see people from all ages, you know, like old, young, and a lot of different uh, groups. You know, journalists try to stay as much out of the story as possible. But in this case, you know, our role as journalists is to reveal truths and bear witness, no matter how uncomfortable they are. When governments are actively trying to silence journalists from being able to do that, what they're doing is they're effectively silencing like the voice of every citizen and every protester. The attacks on the press here feels targeted in a way that I've never really seen before in the U.S. When I was pepper sprayed and tear gassed and beaten and had a concussion grenade explode in my face uh, covering a protest, I have been playing over in my head. Anytime we cover a protest or any sort of uh, unrest, we're always thinking ahead, thinking of where we're going to go where we're going to hide, how we can stay safe. And in that time, we made an active choice to stay very much within a group of journalists off to the side. Things changed when they actively lobbed and fired concussion grenades in our direction and advanced on us. The cops, I saw them shaking their pepper spray bottles and like actively um, attacking us. You know, I filmed this. Uh, and that was the one factor is that I didn't really see that coming. If we as journalists are unable to tell these stories or un are unable to capture what's going on in the streets, a lot of power will go unchecked. One thing that's been really powerful and has really affected me um, is going to the site where, where George Floyd was killed. I see a lot of people go up to the exact site and I see them breaking down in tears. I took a photo of this woman, Veronica Clark, as she embraces her brother, Joe. And in this picture, I just saw such a pain and also such a release, but also such a solidarity that things in America have gotten to this point where a lot of this population sees themselves in what happened on the street. And to, so to see this level of catharsis is both tragic and uh, quite inspiring. I think it shows how overdue a lot of these conversations really are. Okay, in just a moment, we are going to have Dr. Isaac Bogosh in to answer your COVID-19 questions. Here's one of them that we'll answer. When we travel again and have temperature checks at travel locations, will a thermometer be able to distinguish fever from sweating or hot flashes? He's got a lot to say about this. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Tonight, we are once again answering your COVID-19 questions. And joining us now, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, who has recently been appointed by the province of Ontario to a team collecting and analyzing COVID-19 data. Uh, though, Dr. Bogosh, that work is, is pretty uh, in early stages right now. Yeah, it absolutely is. But we're basically looking at uh, getting all the right data housed in the right place so that policymakers and researchers can use this data to really help Ontario and hopefully the rest of Canada fight this pandemic. Okay, well, we'll have to, to book some time later to talk more about that, but let's get to some of the questions that we've been getting for you. Uh, here's one. Are health authorities expecting large outbreaks of COVID-19 in cities where protest marches took place this past week? And I guess that's cities in Canada and the U.S. Yeah, certainly no one would be surprised if there was a spike in cases. We know that exacerbating factors might be some of the protests where we saw 
you know, hundreds or even thousands of people clustered together closely. We saw some protests where people weren't wearing masks. Uh, and, and certainly we saw lots of uh, yelling and, and shouting. And uh, of course, in those settings, it would, it would come to no surprise if, if infection was transmitted. There's other protests where we saw mitigating factors. I mean, all of these were outside, so being outside is extremely helpful. Uh, some places we saw people spread apart, and we saw uh, a high proportion of mask wearing in some protests as well. So in those settings, I think it would be much less likely for this infection to be transmitted. Okay, so here's the crystal ball question. I mean, given all that, and, and given the pace of reopening, particularly here in this country, here's another question. What are the chances that COVID-19 will continue through the summer? I think the chances are extraordinarily high. We know that there's very little immunity in the population. We know that there's a high burden of infection in many parts of the world, including uh, South America, even the Southern United States, South Asia. Uh, we're gonna see a lot more COVID-19 throughout the summer. And I know that some people think that the warmer temperatures or the UV rays will, will help fight this off. But when we see such a high burden of infection globally, I don't think that uh, climate and ultraviolet rays and high temperatures are really going to have much of a factor. If there's a far smaller burden of infection globally, it might play a part, but certainly not where we're at now. So I would expect to see a lot of COVID transmission throughout the summer months. Okay, now you mentioned uh, high temperatures, and here's an interesting twist on that. When we travel again and have temperature checks at travel locations, will a thermometer be able to distinguish fever from sweating or the hot flashes? Yeah, in general, it will. I mean, uh, usually uh, uh, people who are, you know, uh, a little sweaty uh, from walking through an airport or people who are having hot flashes don't actually mount a true fever, whereas people do mount a true fever in the context of some infection. So it most likely will be able to distinguish between most of those cases. Hmm. Having said that, uh, when we think about these temperature checks for the utility of detecting COVID-19, it's actually pretty poor. We know many people with COVID-19 infections will not have a fever. And for that to work, you have to have a fever at the right place at the right time detected with the right instrument. And in fact, this won't be very useful in detecting COVID-19 infections. A lot of this is optics, unfortunately, but, uh, but you know, they may catch a case now and again, but it's, it's really not the most effective way to detect cases of COVID-19. All right, very good to talk to you. Thanks for answering all those questions, Dr. Bogosh. Anytime. And hey, if you've got more COVID-19 questions, you can send them in. Message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send an email at covid at cbc.ca. During the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, another deadly problem in this country has become even worse. Opioid overdoses. As the CBC's Vic Adobia tells us, both Ontario and British Columbia have seen a spike in drug deaths. Writing poetry, a diversion from three months of pandemic upheaval. Except for the safe injection sites, I didn't know really anywhere else to go um, to stay warm or to be safe. When the pandemic hit, she was sleeping here. Her struggle with heroin then went from bad to worse. We've agreed to protect her identity. I OD'd three times and um, woke up, you know, alone because I was using alone. Ontario is experiencing an unprecedented spike in drug deaths, a 25% increase in fatal overdoses compared to the same period last year, according to preliminary numbers. From the frontline workers we work with around the province, they're all saying deaths are going up. Uh, but to hear that number and to see that number, I was not expecting it to be as that high. Ontario is not alone. B.C. saw a 39% jump in overdose deaths in April compared to the same month last year. And in Alberta, the number of opioid-related 911 calls doubled from March to May. Health officials blame increasingly toxic street drugs laced with fentanyl, replacing the usual opioid supply chain. And then you add COVID into the mix. I mean, it's just a disaster of epic proportions. This psychiatrist treats patients with addictions. It's very stressful to be socially isolated and fearful of catching COVID-19. Uh, and when people are stressed and anxious, they may use more substances in order to cope. Health Canada has temporarily eased restrictions on medications used to treat addiction. Some doctors are even prescribing opioids to protect their patients from street drugs. She says it's helped her stabilize. She's now in temporary housing, hoping to stay off the street. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto.
Time for a quick break, and when we come back, a surge in interest for pandemic companions. I've been breeding for 25 years, and I have never seen anything like this before. A lot of Canadians stuck at home are looking for puppies, but what happens when life goes back to normal? We'll be right back. I'm Josh Block. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. As the Black Lives Matter movement shines a light on police brutality, we ask what defunding the police means for Indigenous people in Canada. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, COVID-19 has meant boredom and a fair amount of loneliness for many people. And it turns out a side effect of avoiding each other is a giant demand for puppies. But as breeders and shelters now warn, wanting a furry friend and properly caring for one are two different things. And then there are the scammers. Ellen Morrow looks at the dangers of rushing into puppy love. Puppy love, it turns out, has never been stronger than in the era of COVID. I've been breeding for 25 years. I have never seen anything like this before. Demand for these puppies has quadrupled. Other breeders report the same thing. Fostering and adoptions from shelters are up too. But remember, puppy love isn't a fling. This is not a two or three month deal. Louise Sutherland worries some aren't thinking about the long-term commitment. I foresee the shelters really starting to overflow um, when the shininess of a new puppy wears off. This is not a decision that they should make lightly, um, that it is a lifetime for the dog, right? <laughs> Scammers have noticed the push for puppies too. Last month, an Ontario police force issued this warning after a rash of fake puppy ads online. Pandemic fueled loneliness, police say, making some people easy targets. So they send money in order to get a puppy, but they never receive anything. But if you do get a dog now, this trainer says, think carefully about life after the pandemic. Are you going to have the time then to take care of these puppies? There's going to be a lot of anxious puppies once we get back to our new normal. For Ashley Salisbury, this was the perfect time, but she has a plan for when she's back at work. I'm really fortunate to have my parents who are retired living just around the corner from me, so I've kind of got a little personal doggy daycare going on. So if you're caught in this canine conundrum, get ready for all the attention a dog will need now and for the next 10 to 15 human years. This is my dream in life. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, a bit of luck in the midst of the pandemic. The story of a Yellowknife woman who won big. Our moment is next. Laura Tucho is feeling pretty lucky. She's from Yellowknife and recently won a cool $55 million. Yeah, you heard right. It's the largest prize ever won in the Northwest Territories, and the story behind her big win is our moment. I bought a ticket and I won. It was just a, a routine thing that because of COVID-19, um, my, grand, my granddaughter and I would go out in the afternoon We'll do our little uh, scratches and lot of tickets. The next day, my sister texted me and he, she said, um, did you buy a ticket from 7-Eleven? Uh, well, later my granddaughter comes down and she said, it's somebody from Yellowknife that wants. So I checked my tickets. The numbers were all the same. And then I asked my granddaughter to check it again and she said, Grandma, the number hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> I told my family members, and they were beside themselves. Hmm. <laughs> this feels so good to be talking about a good news story. Our thanks to our colleagues at CBC Radio's Trails and for, for that interview. And uh, apparently, you know, how did she do it? Not special numbers, a quick pick. And uh, she says that her grandkids thought she'd been hurt because she screamed so loudly. <laughs> right. I got to say, you know, my first re reaction whenever I hear these stories about a big lottery win is, is I, I worry for them, you, know, you always hear stories about things turning out poorly, careful what you wish for, but, but I will be cautiously optimistic about this one. Uh, that's the national for this She's June 9th. She's got this. She's got this. <laughs> Good night. Good night.